Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.24, Connecticut and New Netherland. After spending the last two episodes talking about two of the giant figures of the era in John Winthrop and Roger Williams, it is time to move back to the main story. Before we move forward, though, I do want to clarify something from my last episode on Roger Williams. I had mentioned that Williams was the founder of the Baptist Church. What I had actually meant to say is that Williams is the founder of the Baptist Church in North America. The Baptists were actually founded earlier in the 17th century by John Smith in Amsterdam. Sorry about the confusion on that one. This week, I want to introduce a handful of new colonies that are going to have an increasingly important role in our story. Now, thus far, we have formally looked at three colonies in New England. Specifically, we spent several episodes hanging out in Plymouth, and then right before pausing the narrative for the biographies, we had started looking at the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Last time in our episode on Roger Williams, I gave a pretty good deal of attention to the situation in Rhode Island, so I feel pretty good about where they are for right now. This leaves two major colonies in the area that I want to formally bring into our story. The first one we are going to look at today is Connecticut, which will come into existence in 1636. The second one is going to be the New Netherlands, which, though being founded technically years before, would begin coming into its own in the mid-1620s and into the 1630s. Both of these places are going to be critical for several reasons. In regards to both colonies, it is going to open up new competition in the region. Specifically, in regard to the Dutch in the New Netherland, that is going to be an outside competitor, somebody other than the English who has settled the area. This relationship between the English and the Dutch is often going to be fraught with tension, and it's something we're going to keep coming back to. Both colonies are also going to cause tension with the local Indian tribes. We're going to see a little bit of that today in the New Netherlands, where we have the Kieft War. And then again, in our next episode, we're going to focus on the Pequot War, which is going to see Connecticut as its main battlefield. The ideas of a settlement along the Connecticut River was nothing new. In 1632, Edward Winslow had explored the area. Winslow, of course, has come up several times already in this podcast. He was influential in Plymouth and had been a participant during those early meetings with Squanto. Furthermore, if you recall, it was him and William Bradford who wrote Mort's Relations, something that we relied upon as one of our sources when we discussed the early Plymouth colony. So why was Edward Winslow sleuthing around so far from his home in Plymouth? The answer is that he was invited there by the shaman of the tribes along the river. A new player to our story, the Pequots, were causing all kinds of havoc for the river tribes. These tribes likely viewed the English as a check on the aggression of the Pequots. While it is certainly debatable how much those tribes cared for the English, the Pequots were actively killing them and the English weren't. In this way, it is a classic example of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Winslow, intrigued by these possibilities, reached out to the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Realizing their influence over the region, as well as the fact that they had a quickly growing amount of resources, he had hoped that both Plymouth Colony and the Massachusetts Bay Colony could agree on some kind of partnership to jointly run the area and take advantage of the lucrative fur trade that Connecticut offered. Winslow and Bradford made the trip to the Bay Colony where they had a chance to make their pitch directly to John Winthrop. Initially, Massachusetts balked at the offer by Winslow and Bradford, largely because of those angry Pequots in the area that the river tribes wanted help with in the first place. However, by 1635, there was enough growing interest in the area. Mostly drawn due to the fertile lands, there is a rush of people who are now heading towards Connecticut. These settlers come from both Massachusetts and Plymouth. However, there is a third party in this game as well, specifically the Dutch. The Dutch had been long trying to get into the colonial game, and as we will see later today, they have a colony down where modern-day New York is. They had established a fort at New Hope, which is in the southern portion of Connecticut today, just north of Long Island. This must have been concerning for the English. Well, England and the Netherlands had generally good relations. The English still weren't going to be thrilled to see another group of people crashing their party. The Dutch had formed the New Netherlands to the south. The holding in the New Netherlands? That was enough for the English. The last thing they wanted is for the Dutch to have any kind of a foothold inside of New England. The Plymouth settlers, under the command of William Holmes, were sent south along the Connecticut River to buy up land from the river tribes and establish a new settlement. This would end up leading to some tense moments between the Dutch and the English settlers. 
This includes at least one encounter where both the Dutch and the English basically stood around ready to fire on each other with the Dutch possessing cannons. The Dutch made threats that if the English continue along the river, they were going to open fire. In response to these threats, the English promptly continued right along their way. Well, it would make for a heartwarming story to say that the Dutch refrained from firing because of their deep connection with the Pilgrims. Remember that before the Pilgrims went to Plymouth, they had been in Leiden. The more likely answer is that the Dutch weren't exactly interested in starting a war with the English. Well, not a sure thing. Had the Dutch opened fire, it may not have only brought the Plymouth colony to arms, but it would not be a huge stretch to guess that the Bay Colony would join in that fight. The colonists continued along the river before settling in what is now modern-day Windsor, Connecticut. So let's take a moment to review our situation here. The English and the Dutch are uncomfortably coexisting at this point. There are Indian tribes along the river who are hoping that the English would help protect them from the angry Pequot tribes that keep causing all of their problems. This situation isn't going to improve, and for reasons we are going to talk about in the next few weeks, we are only a few years away from a full-blown war with the Pequot tribe. The group that would truly revolutionize Connecticut entered into the scene in September of 1634. A group had come before the Massachusetts General Court, asking for permission to leave the Cambridge area and relocate to Connecticut. Led by Thomas Hooker, a group of settlers sought to leave what they complained was the rocky, unforgiving land in Cambridge and relocate to Connecticut. Hooker himself was born in 1587 and had immigrated to Massachusetts in 1633 on board the Griffin. Hooker, like so many others, had found himself in the crosshairs of William Laud, and suddenly found himself being called to answer for his supposed crimes. Hooker, not all that interested in the proposition, decided to get out of town and head first to Amsterdam. A few years later, he would head across the Atlantic and become a pastor of the Cambridge Church in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. During the meeting, Hooker laid out his mostly economic list of grievances. Amongst the problems was that Cambridge lay on rocky, unsuitable land and was becoming increasingly overcrowded. During the hearing in 1634, the general court decided to reject Hooker's plan to remove to Connecticut, instead promising to enlarge Cambridge to help alleviate some of the more serious problems. This, however, proved to be a short-term solution. Following the decision of 1634, the leaders of the Bay Colony had learned that the Indians in Connecticut had been absolutely decimated by disease. This presented the Bay Company with new openings and opportunities in that region. As we've been discussing, settlers from Plymouth as well as the Dutch were now flooding into that region. Massachusetts, not wanting to lose out, went ahead and decided to approve the settlement after all in 1635. Settling in what would become Hartford, Hooker and his followers would land in an area that was seeing people flock in to settle along the river. Hooker was not the only group that got permission to leave for Connecticut. Three other groups got the same permission. However, it was Hooker's settlement of Hartford that would become so critical. So let me try to give you a quick idea where these settlements all are, so you've got some kind of a map here. Hooker settled in what would become Hartford. There was another settlement in Wethersfield, which is south of Hartford. Another group settled near Windsor, where those settlers from Plymouth have been hanging out for a while now. Finally, there was a group in Springfield in today what is the far southern portion of Massachusetts, right along the border with Connecticut. Well, there are other settlements in Connecticut, including some that are older, it was Hartford and Hooker's group that would become so central to the politics of the region. To begin looking more carefully at Hooker, let's examine why he left Massachusetts in the first place. To be sure, the main reason behind him wanting to leave was economic. However, he did have concerns about the nature of events back in Massachusetts itself. Hooker himself was disturbed over the growing arbitrary nature of the government in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This really manifested for him in seeing how the colony treated dissenters like Roger Williams. Further, he found the church in Massachusetts to be overly restrictive at granting membership. This isn't to say that Hooker himself was some kind of a dissenter or a separatist. He certainly wasn't, nor was he really any kind of a friend of Roger Williams. Hooker was not a supporter of Williams or anybody else like him. Rather, he took issues with the approach of the colony on how they dealt with people like Roger Williams. These beliefs are going to become so important when it comes to Hooker establishing a government over his settlement. For so much of this podcast, I've been warning you guys to be cautious of putting too much importance on any political document and resist calling these things enlightened. However, Hooker's government was something different. 
1639, he's going to adopt what's going to become known as the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. This is a huge step forward on the path to the future United States. Now, with that said, this is the last I'm going to talk about this subject for today. While I do hate glossing over something so huge, I'm going to have an entire episode in the not-too-distant future that is going to spend a significant amount of time on this development, because it's really just that important. For today, just know that Connecticut is moving in the direction of a decidedly more representative government. Over the course of the 1630s, we are going to continue to see new groups settling in that region. In 1637, the Reverend John Davenport would start up a settlement in New Haven. Again, as in the case of Hooker, the settlement was based primarily on economics. Davenport's congregation was made up of merchants who wanted to settle close to the coast. This stands in contrast with projects like Rhode Island, which set up because of some greater concerns for religion and politics. The development of Connecticut is largely born out of economics as opposed to ecumenical concerns. We are going to return to Connecticut often in the weeks to come, especially as we talk about the Quat War, which is going to primarily take place in Connecticut. Likewise, we are going to spend significant time talking about their political structure, as yeah, it's really going to be that big of a deal. However, for this week, we are going to leave our young colony to hang out for a little bit while we switch gears and introduce the second colony of today, the New Netherlands. The New Netherlands has already briefly worked its way into our story. However, I would like to give it more of a formal introduction right here. The New Netherlands made up the area that has become modern-day New York. Today, we are going to look at the origin and the early history of that colony. Now, I know the obvious question is going to be, how did a bunch of Dutch colonies become the English colony of New York? We are not going to really talk about that today, but I'm going to remove your mystery right now. Just know that there is going to be a series of naval wars between the Dutch and the English, among some others, between the 1650s and 70s that would result in the colony switching to English hands. However, those subjects are going to largely be left until next season. For today, I want to focus more on the origins of the colony and how it would ultimately interact with its neighbors. The New Netherlands are going to introduce something new to the colonial experience in the future United States. Arrival. Massachusetts. Plymouth, and to a lesser extent, Virginia, all did compete against each other. However, they were all from the same mother country. They were all ultimately playing for Team England. Now, however, right in the middle of all of this, there's a Dutch settlement to worry about. The area in and around modern-day New York had been extensively explored back around 1609 by English sailor Henry Hudson. Hudson had been hired by the Dutch to scout the area and specifically seek the Northwest Passage. The Dutch would remain interested in the land, but wouldn't be able to do much with it for several years. By the time we get to the early 1620s, the Dutch were actively planning to settle the region. If you'll recall, the Pilgrims had been approached by the Dutch to settle it on their behalf. The Pilgrims passed on the offer, and there is some evidence that the Dutch then did what they could to ensure that the settlement wouldn't end up being along the Hudson. By the early part of the 17th century, the Dutch had emerged as a major power in northern Europe. It therefore should come as no surprise that they were going to eventually want to get into the colonization race. The Dutch had already become well-established players in the North American fur trade, going back to the time of Henry Hudson. All of this trade fell under the purview of the Dutch West India Company. The West India Company recognized that there was a need for a more permanent settlement. They had grown dependent on the waterways of the Hudson, and protecting the mouth of that waterway carried with it some serious economic implications. Had the English, French, or Spanish taken control over the mouth of the Hudson, the Dutch would quickly find themselves shut out of the lucrative fur trade that they had spent the last decade establishing. By creating a settlement, it would be easier to get goods to the fur traders further inland. For the Dutch, it was a win-win proposition. Therefore, in 1624, a group of settlers were sent across the Atlantic under the command of Cornelius May. The group would then break apart upon arrival, with one group going to Fort Orange to continue the fur trade. The remaining settlers then broke into two further groups, with one group landing on Governor's Island in the Hudson, and the other group heading south to establish Fort Nassau, close to what is modern-day Philadelphia. The following year in 1625, another group came along under the command of Willem Verhulst. This group would set up a fort on the island of Manhattan, where they would officially establish the colony of the New Netherland. In 1626, the now infamous purchase of Manhattan Island took place between the Dutch and the Manhattan Indian tribe. 
Different sources show different amounts and introduce the idea that Barter may have been involved in the deal, but the number I keep coming back to on the sales price is about 60 guilders. And no, I'm not about to try and figure out how much money that would have been in 1626 currency, as that is a very messy craft at best. Suffice it to say, however, that it was not a very good deal for the Manhattan Indians. With Manhattan now in Dutch control, no time was wasted in fortifying the island and establishing it as a means to control the mouth of the Hudson. Manhattan itself during this era was known as New Amsterdam and would become the political, economic, and social nexus of the New Netherland. The colony was set up with a central governor who had near dictatorial powers. Unlike in New England, indentured servitude was the most common way that people arrived in the colony, being required to serve a term of six years before being granted their freedom. Similar to the conditions in Jamestown, everybody was required to grow food. Luckily for the settlers, food grew relatively well on Manhattan and the Dutch managed to avoid the widespread starvation that the English had dealt with, particularly in Virginia. Unlike in New England, where there was a massive wave of immigration due to religious tension, no such tension existed in the Netherlands at this time. Those coming to the New Netherlands weren't even really pretending that proselytizing was their mission. This endeavor was all about money and protecting the valuable inland fur trade. As has been so common of a theme, the colony was not a financial success and ended up being a drain on the economy. By the time 1628 rolled around, the Dutch West India Company had basically given up on the colony and stopped investing any more money into what they viewed as nothing more than a money pit. One of the hallmarks of New Netherland is the religious tolerance that the colony exhibited. This really shouldn't come as a surprise either. When the congregation that would become the pilgrims was chased out of Scrooby, where did they end up? That's right, Leiden. The Dutch were religiously tolerant as compared to the other colonies, and this is something that would remain a hallmark of Dutch America. Ultimately, here is what we are left with. We have a colony that, from the beginning, is relatively stable and certainly never sees the massive amounts of death that the Virginia colony had seen. They didn't even see as much as the Plymouth colony. However, despite this, the colony was never really economically viable. As we have seen from time to time, there is one truth when it comes to colonization in the future United States. It is, by and large, a terrible investment. One of the problems that really came to define the New Netherland was that the expansion remained incredibly slow. In 1630, the population of the colony was only around 300 people. The Dutch attempted to give generous land grants that would get people heading to New Netherland. However, these proved difficult for settlers to obtain, and it largely proved ineffective. It wasn't until the Dutch relaxed their monopoly on the fur trade that you start seeing more people come over during the latter half of the 1630s. Interestingly, of those coming over during this period, you do end up getting a large mix of Germans and Jewish people. This, again, can probably be attributed directly to that tolerance that the Dutch showed. The structure of the New Netherland is similar to what we see in Virginia, largely made up of a few large landowners. A constant complaint from those who were not amongst the wealthiest few was the autocratic nature of the government. The power within the colony was held mostly by a single individual in the role of the director general. The director general had near absolute power, with a small number of others around him to help administer the colony. For the most part, the individual settler had absolutely no say in government. This is in stark contrast to what we see in New England and even from what we see in Virginia. Recall that in Jamestown there was an assembly that would meet with some regularity. In the New Netherlands, however, there was no assembly. There was just the director general. When the settlers demanded a government that was more in tune with their needs, then director general William Kieft basically just blows them off. Conflicts between the Indians and the Dutch were also a constant problem. The Dutch, for their part, actually did purchase their land from the Indians. Sure, maybe they terribly underpaid them, but at least they made something that looked like an attempt. The problem, however, is that the Indians did not seem to fully understand the ramifications of a sale of the land to the Dutch. This would lead to increasingly growing tensions between the Indians and the Dutch settlers. The situation escalated when Director General Kieft issued a tax on wampum. Wampum was made from oyster shells and came in different colors, specifically white and purple. Wampum was highly valued amongst the Indians and throughout the region was commonly being used as a means by which to barter. I don't want to go all the way down and call it a form of currency, but it absolutely was important amongst the Native Americans and was a central part of their trade structure. Kieft, by sticking a tribute on Wampum, did nothing to make himself any friends and quickly became a source of a whole lot of anger. If you listened last week, you know how the story is going to go. Kieft has his small spot in history because he has a war named after him. 
As I covered the war briefly last time, I'm not going to rehash it other than to say it went very poorly for the Dutch and that Roger Williams ended up becoming the mediator in the peace negotiations. The end of the war between Kieft and the Lenape people marked a real low point for the Dutch in North America. The war had been unpopular when it began, and it certainly did not grow in popularity when the Lenape were winning. The biggest problem for Kieft is that he simply didn't have the population necessary to actually conduct the kind of war that he needed. He had wanted to eliminate the Lenape threat, much in the same way that we are going to see next time when we discuss the Bequat War. However, in this case, Kaif was spread far too thinly to ever have much of a shot of doing that. Instead, his people endured nearly two years of constant harassment at the hands of the Lenape until Roger Williams came over and worked his magic to bring the conflict to an end. The lasting legacy of the New Netherlands in so many ways is that of a somewhat failed colony. In some ways, it's hard to mark it as failed. After all, there wasn't some huge die-off like we see in Virginia. It's most definitely not some lost colony. After all, it is still going to morph into New York City eventually. At the same time, however, it is very hard to see the colony as anything but a failure. The colony never really thrives under Dutch rule and gets hit hard in Kaif's War. The colony featured an overbearing government that basically everybody hated and was about as far away from representative government as you can get. And yet, religious freedom was a thing for the most part, though there is some ineffective attempt to push back when the Quakers began appearing in the 1650s. So despite some level of religious toleration, none of this is really enough to make the colony look all that successful. Financially, the colony was at least self-sufficient, however, it certainly was not bringing in the Dutch the kind of money that they need to justify pumping any real money back into it. Though the colony would grow some during the 1650s, it's not going to be until the 1660s when the English captured it that we would see it move towards what we know it to be today. By 1674, New York officially belonged to England, and New Netherland was dead. This is something we are going to come back to next season and talk with more detail about how New Netherland ended up in the hands of the English and how New York itself was founded. I'm going to wrap up today by covering a bonus colony because I'm sure somewhere out there somebody is currently yelling that I cannot possibly leave out poor New Sweden. And as I have set out to tell a good complete story here, I'm going to give in to the peer pressure and briefly talk about the colony of New Sweden. Now, for a lot of you, you're probably asking right now, hey, wait, there was a new Sweden? After all, everybody knows about the English colonies. Plus, I think the Dutch colony was pretty well known. I mean, I think at least everybody out here has at some point heard that New York was once known as New Amsterdam. Not to mention that you still have a large Dutch influence throughout states like Pennsylvania, so learning that there was a strong Dutch colony there isn't really a shocking thing. However, I don't think anybody is really going to say that Wilmington, Delaware, yeah, that's roughly where New Sweden was, is renowned for its Swedish influence. During the 17th century, Sweden was at the height of their power and did set out with their own goals of colonizing the New World. Settling in the area around modern-day Delaware, their holdings also extended into modern-day Pennsylvania and New Jersey. The Swedes were largely dependent on the help of the Dutch, who also would generally prove to be their biggest adversary. The Dutch were largely responsible for providing the capital that kept the colony afloat, as well as the expertise that the Swedes desperately needed. However, at the same time, it was the Dutch who they were constantly clashing with. The Dutch West India Company was staunchly opposed to the Swedish claims as they were impinging on the sovereignty of the New Netherland. This, coupled with a serious lack of resources, limited the growth of New Sweden and never truly allowed the colony a chance to grow and flourish. The colony of New Sweden came to an end on September 15th, 1655. In 1655, the Second Northern War broke out in Europe. For the purpose of this podcast, the only thing you need to know about the Second Northern War is that the Dutch and the Swedish were on opposite sides of the conflict. The previous year, the Dutch and the Swedish had some minor skirmishes in North America, which accumulated in the Swedish capturing a Dutch fort, Fort Casimir. With the outbreak of the war, however, the Dutch quickly stormed back, retook the fort, and then the Dutch just kept going and quickly captured the entire settlement, which was then incorporated into New Netherland. A decade or so later, New Netherland itself would end up falling into English control, which included the territory and the settlement that had previously been New Sweden. So there you go, for all you fans of New Sweden, a brief history on a mostly forgotten settlement. 
However, if you are bored, take a moment and go check out the flag of the city of Wilmington. It pays a nice little homage to the colony of New Sweden, and I'll go ahead and throw that up on the website for comparison's sake. The New Netherland and New Sweden colonies are two examples of non-English colonies that would appear briefly in the future United States. We know that soon enough, those two would be folded into the growing English sphere of influence over North America. Meanwhile, in New England, we see continued growth and power of the Puritans who continue throughout the 1630s to flood into that region. With growth, however, comes tension with the people who were already there. We have specifically mentioned a few times now that there is increasing tension in New England, specifically with the Pequot tribe, and that will eventually boil over into a war. Next time, we are going to dive into that war and spend our time looking at the Pequot War. We will look at the long-term effect of it, the immediate consequences, and how the entire thing went down. Before I wrap things up for today, I do want to mention a few things that I'm currently working on. My attempts at maintaining a social media presence for this podcast have left something to be desired. However, I'm working on getting better at that and want to point out the three places where you can come and chat about the podcast and history in general. First, I do have a Facebook page. Just search for the political history of the United States and it should pop right up. You can likewise follow me on Twitter at US Hist Podcast. That is US H I S T Podcast. And then finally, I do hang out over on a Discord server called History Podcasts. This one is especially cool because there are several other history podcasters there who can talk about a wide variety of historical events with you. So I invite you to come ask questions or just chat about history in general. I will throw links up to all of these places on the website, which if you don't know where that is, it is at uspoliticalpodcast.com. Okay, with that, I want to thank you again for listening, and I will see you all back here in two weeks as we discuss the Pequot War. <laughs>